Good morning, everybody. My name is Julian, and I work for AWS as a tech evangelist focusing on AI and machine learning. In this session, I would like to discuss how hardware innovation is critical to machine learning and how we can all help developers adopt new AI uh, chips. As we all know, machine learning is eating the world. Uh, at AWS, we see customers from literally every vertical, uh, every size and shape, startups, enterprise, nonprofit, uh, government, education, uh, adopting machine learning to build better services, better products, and improve um, the user experience for their own customers. So let's try to step back and see how this actually happened. I don't think this happened by accident. In fact, machine learning and deep learning, uh, a really, really popular subset of machine learning, have happened because um, several planets actually aligned. The first one is the availability of large digital data sets. Uh, as you probably know, machine learning and deep learning are nothing really new. Neural networks have been around since the late uh, 40s. So, you know, why now? Well, in, in the good old days, uh, it was really difficult to collect and store and, uh, and share digital data. Um, and until quite recently, it was particularly expensive to do that as well. And in recent years, this has completely changed. One re obvious reason is, of course, the Internet and, uh, and its uh, mountains of user-generated content, email posts, uh, product reviews, hotel reviews, uh, trip reviews, images, videos, and, and much, much more, right? So it's, it's quite easy to go and, and either scrape uh, the web for those or, or use your own uh, user-generated data on your own websites. And on, on, on top of that, of course, uh, everything is either uh, web or mobile these days. So um, customers can, uh, can actually use... Oh, In addition, transactions now happen on the web uh, and, and on the mobile apps. So this tends to generate quite a lot of data, whether it's search queries, uh, page views, product views, clicks, purchases, etc. And all that data can easily be stored and processed later on. And of course, we have open data sets, uh, which can be academic data sets or uh, just data sets put together by the community. Data sets like ImageNet, which has been critical for uh, computer vision. Uh, WMT, which is uh, really important for machine translation. And of course, medical data sets and, uh, and others are now easily accessible on the web. The second reason is the availability of scalable and cost-effective infrastructure. Uh, as you know, um, storing data, training models, deploying models requ um, requires quite a lot of infrastructure. And again, for decades, it was difficult to get the amount of uh, storage and, and compute power required to train large uh, scale jobs. And if you could do that, it, it was probably a, an expensive proposition, making it you know, um, inaccessible to smaller companies and, and individual researchers. Uh, so commodity hardware has changed this, servers, storage, networking, all, all that stuff uh, is now much, much cheaper. Plus, of course, cloud computing has made it all uh, accessible on demand and uh, just paying as you go, very easy to manage um, using managed services uh, and without any compromise on, uh, on security, high availability, etc. So it's never been easier to go and fire up your training cluster or your deployment cluster and, and just pay for what you use, no upfront costs. And in fact, um, this is backed by uh, research from uh, Nucleus published last year that says that 96% of deep learning workloads are actually running in the cloud. And out of those 96%, 89% is running on AWS. So I think this goes to show how cloud 
has completely changed the game for machine learning and deep learning and uh, and and how it's pretty uh, pretty important these days the third reason why machine learning and deep learning exploded is the availability of open source tools so going back to the pioneers like torch and theano in the early 2000s and then hadoop and spark which are not machine learning tools per se but uh, that are uh, big data tools uh, which are really critical to um, building machine learning workflows in a lot of cases and then of course all the popular libraries that uh, we, we use every day, TensorFlow, Keras, MXNet, PyTorch, Chainer, and more, um, completely simplified uh, the, the process of building, training, and, and deploying models. And last but not least, a hardware acceleration has made it possible to um, train large, complex models on really large data sets. Um, NVIDIA GPUs and CUDA, uh, have been have been instrumental, but CPU architectures have made a lot of progress as well. Intel AVX helps uh, speed up machine learning on the CPU platforms, and then of course the slightly more exotic platforms like FPGA and ASICs have also popped up in recent years. So to prove my point, you know, let's try and put all that history together. Let's start our trip in 1999 when NVIDIA launched their first GPU. And of course, at the time, we used them for 3D gaming. Uh, someone else had a better ID, and six years later, the first paper showing how to use GPUs to accelerate machine learning was published. And six years is a long time, but it was a breakthrough. And, uh, and I'm quite sure writing machine learning code on GPUs at the time was quite a, quite a challenge. A little bit later, AWS was launched. Services like Amazon EC2, Amazon S3 went live. And uh, for the first time, cloud-based compute and storage was available to customers. A few months later, CUDA 1.0 was released. And this is a, a major milestone because it made it so much easier to write uh, accelerated code with GPUs using high-level languages. Um, and just two years later, uh, another breakthrough happened where, um, uh, again, GPUs were uh, used to accelerate uh, deep neural networks. And a few months later, um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Theano uh, 0 0.3 was the first open source library to support GPU training with CUDA. And so for the first time, uh, you could just grab an open source library and pretty easily train uh, machine learning and deep learning code on GPUs without having to write any GPU specific code, right? And I think this was, um, this was a breakthrough. And again, uh, at about the same time, AWS launched uh, its first GPU instances. So the first cloud-based GPU instances and pretty much immediately after that in the next months uh, next year we saw the explosion of uh, of machine learning and deep learning and specifically deep learning started to achieve superhuman performance on computer vision tasks like ImageNet and also on handwriting recognition and, and other tasks imagine that between the release of theano with uh, gpu support and superhuman performance there's only one year Right. Uh, compare that to the six years that it took for uh, the first machine learning algo to actually leverage GPUs. So the pace is definitely accelerating thanks to open source tools, thanks to um, um, accelerated computing and the combination of everything inside cloud platforms. The train kept rolling. And of course, in 2015, 2016, um, a, a string of uh, amazing libraries were released, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, MXNet, and other ones, uh, giving developers more options, uh, more language support, etc., to uh, build, again, machine learning and deep learning models with using open source tools, right? And we also launched uh, the first um, FPGA-based in, uh, instances in the cloud shortly after, 
And uh, a little more than a year ago, we launched Inferentia, a custom chip designed for high throughput and low cost inference. And we'll talk about those a little more uh, later in the session, right? So that's, uh, you know, that's the story. And, uh, and I think there's a pretty clear relationship between accelerated computing, tooling, uh, uh, scalable, and cost-effective infrastructure in the cloud. Um, you know, all those things uh, work together and help us build a project and build them faster, innovate faster. And the situation today is really this. Um, State-of-the-art models are, are published by researchers. They are implemented uh, sometimes by the researchers themselves, sometimes by the community, literally reading from the paper, uh, training them, sharing them uh, openly on GitHub uh, or on the AWS Marketplace, which has a collection of uh, hundreds of machine learning models that you can try. And so you can just go and grab those models and within minutes, uh, you can deploy and, and test them on your infrastructure of choice on AWS, whether it's CPU, GPU, FPGA, Inferentia. And you can just go and again, literally within minutes, start test testing them at minimal cost, figuring out if they work for you. So, of course, you know, that's the story so far, but I'm sure new hardware platforms will come. So how do we help those, uh, those platforms be successful uh, with developers, what does it take uh, for those platforms to be um, uh, to be a developer hit? So, I think we can make the following observation. So, of, of course, hardware innovation is critical for machine learning performance, right? I think this point is well understood. However, most machine learning practitioners don't know much, if anything, about hardware, right? They're data scientists, and they're software engineers, and and let's face it, they don't care much for it, right? They generally don't care much for uh, IT and infrastructure. So, you know, uh, understand uh, asking them to understand the finer points of uh, of chips is just you know, asking for too much. So they don't care for it. They they don't want to see it. In fact, it, the hardware should ideally be completely transparent to them, right? It should be a parameter that they set, and uh, and just enjoy the performance. So developer-friendly tools are paramount for adoption. Um, this point is probably the most important one. You, you need to invest a lot in your tools. So of course, everyone out there is providing some sort of SDK that's abstracting the hardware, and it could be you know, a reasonably high level, but it's really not enough. You're asking too much. Um, you're asking developers who are you know, ML-focused and ML-obsessed to learn your APIs and uh, and all of them will you know require some hardware knowledge. So that that's not going to work. Uh, I, I believe the best way to go is that this SDK must work with the tools and languages that ML practitioners use. So either through direct integration and and CUDA was a great example of that. CUDA was integrated in all the uh, machine learning libraries that I mentioned before, making it obvious and, and instantaneous to use GPUs for training, right? Set a parameter and, you know, use CUDA, use GPU, whatever it is, and, you know, job done. Sometimes it's not possible, uh, especially if you have uh, edge-based uh, platforms. Um, so you will need some tool chain between, you know, model training and model deployment, but please make it as simple as possible and as, uh, as easy as possible to use, even if you have no hardware knowledge, right? It should be just a, a couple of calls, a couple of APIs, and, and everything should be hidden away from developers. Otherwise, they just won't adopt it. And of course, you know, cloud is, is everywhere. Uh, you saw that earlier stat. So you need to have a strategy to make your tools available in the cloud uh, in the easiest way possible. And well, all the, all the above um, requires that you understand pretty well how people will use your tools and, you know, where, where do they work? How do they work? What, what the workflows are, et cetera. So don't assume that you know best, okay? Um, you need to engage with existing and potential users. You need to talk to them. You need to collect feedback on, uh, on you know, languages that they use, the tools that they use, the workflows that they use, and, uh, and act accordingly. 
Uh, again, silicon companies uh, are, are not the best place to understand uh, the machine learning workflow. So please go and figure out what people want from you. Don't, uh, don't assume that you know. In fact, you know, everybody talks about the ML community, but it's really the ML communities, you know, plural, um, because scientists, researchers, data scientists, ML engineers, ML ops, all use different tools, different workflows. Uh, they have different goals sometimes. So, you know, one size does not really fit all. So you need to have a modular approach um, that, you know, um, helps uh, the widest range of people use your tools. Uh, it's great if you have fantastic tools for researchers, but if if deploying models is a nightmare, you know ML ops will push back on that, and uh, and you know your adoption won't be as good. So, understand who you're dealing with. You know who are your customers, who are your personas, and and talk to all of them to understand how they work. And of course, the best way to do this is to go where those people are. So go to meetups, uh, which are online these days, but it doesn't matter. Write blog posts, you know, get some feedback, get some comments on what you're working on. Push some sample code to GitHub, you know, put, show people how it's done, you know, and, and, uh, and again, help, help them get started. And, you know, maybe hire developer advocates, people who will know how to speak uh, with those communities and get some feedback. Uh, and that's probably not hardware engineers. And again, no offense, it's just a different culture. Okay, so go and, and do all of those things and uh, hopefully you'll be on your way. So let's look at uh, three examples in recent AWS history. And uh, you know, I'm not claiming we're doing everything right, but uh, we have those mechanisms in place, right? collecting feedback, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and hopefully the, the way we've built uh, those FPGA instances and, and SageMaker, Neo, and Inferentia uh, will help you understand and, and you know, point you in the right direction for developer adoption. So the first example is uh, deploying FPGA instances in the cloud. So in AWS Lingo, they're called uh, F1 instances. And so what they are, uh, they are basically, you know, um, regular servers with uh, Xilinx uh, FPGAs from one to eight FPGAs inside of them. Um, and so you fire up the server just like you would fire up uh, any, uh, any EC2, uh, EC2 server. You start from an Amazon machine image, which, which fires up, let's say, uh, Ubuntu or Amazon Linux. Okay. And, uh, and then using um, a collection of tools that we provide, you can load uh, what we call Amazon FPGA images, so the, the, the binary file that runs on the FPGA. And, uh, and then those uh, FPGAs can uh, communicate with the application running on the server CPU, right? And they can also access uh, external memory uh, that is uh, present on the server. Okay, so it's really, you know, FPGAs inside uh, an EC2 instance. So that's the hardware part. We could spend an hour talking about it, but again, our focus is more about developers. So when it comes to FPGAs, um, people use well-known tools like Xilinx Vivado. What we've done is we built this developer AMI. Uh, remember AMI means Amazon Machine Image. It's the file that we use to fire up the EC2 instance. And so everything is pre-installed in there. Right, so um, you just uh, you, and you have a you have a um, a free license, by the way. I should mention that. So you just fire up the server, you pay for the server, use that uh, FPGA image, uh, wait for a few a few minutes for the, the instance to come up, and then you can open Vivado and and get to work. Right, so no no time wasted uh, uh, installing tools, no time wasted learning new tools. If you're involved with, uh, Xilinx FPGAs, you are using Livado already. So the same familiar tools and, um, uh, and you know, you can just get to work really quickly. And so when it comes to, uh, actually, uh, working with the FPGA chip, uh, we designed, uh, an FPGA SDK, uh, which of course is available on that AMI. It's also open source on GitHub. I think this one is a good example of, again, um, hardware innovation, um, packaging, well-known tools that FPGA developers use, 
and and building a high level SDK that abstracts uh, some of the complexity of uh, of the FPGA, making it possible to use uh, you know OpenCL, C, C++ to write FPGA code. So even if you're not an FPGA expert, you can get the job done. So the you know the the entry ticket uh, into writing code for FPGAs is quite lower and you can get started in minutes. You can run some examples from that GitHub repository and figure out what FPGA can do for you. The second example that I'd like to mention is a service called Amazon SageMaker Neo. So you may have heard about Amazon SageMaker. It's a fully managed service for machine learning on AWS. It includes lots of different capabilities. The problem that Neo solves is optimizing models for hardware platforms. So you train, you build and train your model as usual. You use your, uh, your favorite algo in TensorFlow, PyTorch, or one of the built-in algos in, uh, in SageMaker. And then you can compile it using Neo. We'll see that in a second. And you can compile it for a list of hardware platforms. Okay, some of them are cloud-based. Some of them are embedded platforms. The compilation process in Neo is pretty complicated, as you can imagine. Uh, first, we parse the model, uh, put it into a, a common format. Then the tool will look at the graph and the tensors and try to optimize both based on the capabilities of the, of the hardware platform that we're targeting. And then finally, the tool generates uh, machine code using a low-level compiler. And you know, machine learning practitioners don't want to hear anything about it. So the way it actually works is you call a single API called compile model. You set the instance family, so in this case, the Raspberry Pi. You define the shape, the input shape of the model. Here it's a computer vision model taking three channel uh, 224 by 224 image. And finally, I define the uh, library that was used to train a model, MXNet 1.51, and the location of uh, the compiled mo model. Okay, that's all it takes. And all the complexity is hidden uh, inside of that. So that's pretty reasonable, okay? Ask the developer, hey, what's, what's your model? What platform are you targeting? Of course, they will know that. And everything else is completely hidden from them. When it comes to deploying, um, we actually use what we call the deep learning runtime, uh, which is also open source. And it's a really, really compact runtime that you can use to load uh, a model and, uh, and predict with it. So again, there's complexity involved in how the model is loaded and, and on what uh, actual hardware it's loaded, but we don't want to know, right? So uh, if we're deploying on uh, AWS managed infrastructure, for example, with SageMaker, it's a one-liner called deploy and, uh, and tell SageMaker uh, what kind of uh, EC2 instance you want to use for deployment. And, and you know, everything is taken care of, right? The, the model will be loaded with the deep learning runtime and you don't need to know the first thing about it. If you're deploying on an embedded platform, then uh, you simply need to install the runtime there and import it uh, and just load your model and then predict. Okay, literally again, uh, a one-liner. So Neo is a good example of a, a very complex process compiling machine learning models for uh, different platforms made super simple. And the last example I want to talk about is Inferentia. So Inferentia is a custom chip designed by AWS for high throughput, uh, low cost uh, predictions. And of course, we could talk about the hardware for, uh, for hours. It's, uh, it's very, very interesting and fascinating. So if you're a hardware person, this is great. That's the bit you wanna hear about. But if you're a developer, you don't really care much. Um, you just wanna leverage that for, again, high throughput and uh, low cost predictions. So you do that by using an SDK called the Neuron SDK. Uh, which is available on GitHub. So the Neuron SDK is a compiler that will compile uh, a TensorFlow MXNet or PyTorch model that you train as usual. And you will grab the compiled model and you will use the Neuron runtime 
to execute it on an inferential uh, instance, right? And of course you have profiling tools as well. Like I said, it supports the major framework, so you don't need to change the way are you working with, uh, uh, with your models and your libraries. Train as usual and then use Neuron to compile and, uh, and load models on, uh, on inferential chips. Um, it's just a couple of lines of code. Again, I saved you the actual code, but there's nothing fancy here. There's nothing complicated. Uh, we provide uh, documentation and examples. And again, everything is on GitHub. And you can run our examples and again, get started in minutes and, uh, and use the state of the arch uh, inferential chip um, without knowing anything about hardware, which is really where we're trying to get. So I hope those three examples show you, uh, you know, give you uh, some insight on how to build uh, hardware platforms that developers can adopt uh, to make their own projects more, more successful, more efficient, more cost effective, more scalable. And again, it's all about development tools. It's all about open source. Um, and it's all about trying to disrupt uh, as little as possible the way that your users are working. And, you know, just insert your technology in their existing workflows and, uh, and show them the benefits of that. Uh, it's the end of the session already. Unfortunately, I'll, I'll be happy to answer questions, some resources to get you started. Uh, so resources on F1 instances and uh, FPGAs, some resources on SageMaker and SageMaker Neo, uh, resources on Inferentia, uh, my blog and my YouTube channel as well, if you're interested in machine learning on AWS in general. And uh, the last thing I want to mention is if you've never heard about SageMaker, um, I really recommend that you take a look. Um, it's, uh, it's a really popular service. We have tens of thousands of customers using it. And, uh, and I published a book about SageMaker just a few weeks ago. Uh, and uh, you can go and grab it with a pretty sweet discount on uh, Amazon and, and pack it. Okay, until November 11th. So don't wait. And, uh, and this will get you started on uh, machine learning on AWS and SageMaker. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me today. I hope you learned a few things. And uh, I, you can uh, ping me anytime in the future if you have questions. And until then, I wish you a very good day. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.